Two weeks ago, I got to play Kerbal Space Program 2 early at the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. I had three hours to pump out as much gameplay as possible and managed an Apollo-style MUN mission and single stage to orbit space plane mission, both of which became videos on this channel. Link in the description if you've not seen those. But after landing that space plane, I still had like 35 minutes of playtime left. So with the clock ticking, I had to think fast about what to do. And spoiler, I didn't really manage to do anything complete, but I still managed to create some footage that I reckon you guys will enjoy. So consider this video a spiritual successor to my recent three stories of failure in KSP1. This is three stories of frolicking adventures of incomplete endeavors in Kerbal Space Program 2. We begin with mission number one, in which I... I set out to make a small sized rover that I could do a nice return mission for on Juna. There's the rover body there. And then it came to choosing the wheels and I accidentally clicked these big ones and I thought, oh wow, I've got to use these. So then I changed the plan completely and decided to just build a Mahusif rover using this new cockpit. So really this would have been a better plan from the get-go, wouldn't it? Uh, this new rover cockpit piece. We use the giant new wheels and just have a fun old time, I suppose. Now I'm going to speed the footage up somewhat in editing here, just so I'm not, you know, spending ages and ages building this rover, but I'm still playing it at reasonably close to real-time speed, because I feel like whilst I was trying to find bits to put on the rover, I did quite a good overview of the parts screen. I don't know why it never occurred to me that that might be a good thing to film, just showing all the parts in KSP2 like that. There's a big crew cab in there, large size, uh, sort of the uh, 3.5 meter diameter crew cabin. That's pretty cool. Obviously, we've got these new rover wheels, which uh, I can't attach just yet. I need to add some sort of framework. Those big wheels there returning from KSP-1. So I was just trying to find some sort of structural body parts to mount underneath the two crew cabin modules there uh, that I could then attach the wheels and batteries and stuff to. So in the end, I wait for these. Look, look at how many sort of different truss structures we have now. These are all obviously here to help facilitate the construction of gigantic interplanetary ships and, of course, eventually interstellar ships as well. Uh, but yeah, so I decided to go for this truss structure here, and then I added the uh, the wheels. Just let me figure it out. So yeah, symmetry, you might blink and you miss it, but you still cycle through symmetry modes, like in KSP-1, by pressing the X button on the keyboard. But radial symmetry and mirror symmetry are now part of the same symmetry system. So in KSP-1, you're either in radial symmetry mode or mirror symmetry mode. Mirror symmetry for space planes and rovers and stuff, radial for vertical rockets. And it was kind of a bit awkward having the two different systems, but in KSP-2... Um, what you do is you cycle through the symmetry uh, by pressing X. When you reach the max, when you get to eight-way symmetry, pressing X again doesn't bring you back to one-way symmetry. It instead puts you in mirror symmetry mode. So mirror symmetry is now... Does that make sense? I don't know. Hopefully it does. If it doesn't, when you play the game, you'll get it. You'll just get it. So I don't even know why I'm spending that much time fixating on this, to be honest. Here, I'm adding lots and lots and lots of parachutes because this is a big, heavy rover. I was designing it to land on Juno, which of course has a very thin atmosphere. So we kind of need as much parachute power as possible to get this thing to slow down for safe landing. But here we are driving it on the uh, runway. And I'm actually going to uh, rewind here so you can hear the audio because listen to this. That's cool. The hatch opens. Right, anyway. I think that's uh, that's good. Yeah, so there we are. How's that for sound effects, eh? you got sound of the wheels on the tarmac, and it then changes when we move to a different terrain surface, so... Uh, that was really, really cool. I really liked that feature. I also loved the parachute deployment sounds and the animation and the fact that the little hatch, as Live Matt pointed out, the little hatches and doors opened on the parachute modules. Just really great stuff. I love the little features like that. Uh, now it comes to uh, driving this thing on Juno, and I'm just using the cheat menu. Um, yes, it returns, at least for this pre-release version of the game. I don't know if it's going to be in the final version. Pause to let the little Kerbal do his thing, whoever made that announcement. And here we are, descending down to June. I'm going to switch over to live Matt now for my reaction as it happened. I think this main shoot is like what's causing me problems. So I'm just going to cut that one. We have also lost our main parachute, but it looks like we're still going fairly slow. Disaster again. 
I can't see. Oh, perfect. Yeah, one of the downsides of the uh, the headset microphones that we had when playing this game is that you can it clearly picks up the person sitting next to you. So uh, Billy Wynn Jr. features heavily in uh, live Matt's reactions because he was uh, also commentating over his footage uh, at the game station next door to me. He will be appearing later on in this video. So uh, yeah, get, get, get hyped for that. Get that viewer retention up, eh? And here we are driving on the surface of Juna. Now, the reason you can't hear the sound of the wheels on the ground it's because they don't make any sound. So obviously, not every single surface of every single planet and moon uh, has a sound yet for vehicles driving over their surface. So I'm guessing that's going to be that's part of why the game is in early access, right? I imagine all that's going to get added as development continues. So uh, yeah, here we are driving on the surface of Juno, though. How cool is this? And I love these wheels. These wheels are great. We were kind of missing this size in Kerbal Space Program One. You had like sort of medium sized wheels and then gigantic wheels and the gigantic wheels they were really difficult to build into a rover that looked good these wheels is like the missing middle that we needed so i love this wheel size and obviously i love this uh the capsule which uh, you can't see because i'm focusing on the back of the craft but the front cabin there you go uh that's brilliant uh, i love i hope we get more and more rover parts and i'd like to try and build maybe an aircraft that uses that cockpit as well don't know how aerodynamic it is. Guess there's only one way to find out. And here I sort of, uh, I lost control. I think the wheels are just too close together. I need to, uh, practice my river building skills, I think. Let's just switch to live mat now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can the crew walk away? Yes or no? Yes, they can. Right, let's just, uh, let's just go back to the cover space at the time. Now, I don't know if you caught that sound effect. Maybe you could rewind the footage if not. But did you hear how, like, when different parts separated from the rover and hit the ground, they made different kind of sounds? And, like, clunking and hissing effect. Like, the sound design in this game is top-notch. And it's only going to get better as they add more things like, you know, sound for driving on the surface of other planets and moons, as discussed. Really, really excited to see kind of how, sa like, sound is, am is amazing in this game. <laughs> Anyway, you might be wondering what I'm doing in the vehicle assembly building here, just staring at the screen, not doing anything. It's because I was trying to think what I had time for. We only had a very short amount of time left to continue playing the game. And then Matt Lown, a genius, thought this. I reckon we've got enough time for a Juno mission. At the very least, we'll, we'll do some of a Juno mission. <laughs> So yeah guys, the uh, the race was well and truly on. I was going to try and build a Juno rocket. I'm playing this footage back at real time speed. You can see how frantically I was putting this thing together. I've got to build a Juno rocket, get to Juno as fast as possible because I've got like 25 minutes. Oh, I, I don't even know how much longer was left. I mean, I'm just going to zoom out on the editing time. Yeah, there was like barely any time at all left. So I was trying to build this rocket as fast as physically possible, which meant having to guess how much hydrogen I would need. I kind of assumed that the hydrogen fuel tank would have a similar... By the way, there's the extra large nuclear engine that we now have. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of guessed that maybe the density of hydrogen would be about the same as the density of liquid fuel in Kerbal Space Program 1, so I figured this sort of ship looked like it would have enough delta V from low curb in orbit to get to Juno and back. Obviously, we got a lot. And, hey, see this? Uh, did, there's a trip planner. So you can type in where you want to go and where you want to end up, and um, it will just tell you kind of what your ship can and can't do. I thought that was a little, a cool little feature. I don't really know exactly how it works, because again, I was against the clock, and I just said, right, I can see this is here, this is kind of neat, I'll look into this later. And, um, yeah, that, that's a, but it looks like there is a planner to help you, uh, you know, see what your ship is capable of. Now here you can see I detached the uh, nuclear engine and the hydrogen fuel tank and they've not gone all translucent like they would in Kerbal Space Program 1 and that's because you can build multiple ships simultaneously. So if I wanted to build a second ship next to the current, the one I'm building out of that hydrogen tank that's no longer attached, I could, I could just build that separately. So I thought that's kind of a, a neat little, neat little thing. Here I'm just checking out how big some of the hydrogen tanks are. I mean, look at that 2x one. Oh, that's a big old boy down there. So uh, yeah, I don't. Is hydrogen not that dense, maybe, compared to methane? I'll have to, I'm going to have to investigate it. I mean, obviously, I know 
the actual element, the density of the real element hydrogen, but is it going to be different for the purposes of balancing a video game? Uh, but here we are constructing the fly safe, which is of course now the uh, default vessel name. I'm I think we're going to miss the untitled spacecraft though. That was always, I don't know, I guess because it just became a meme. <laughs> uh, but I did like the uh, the untitled spacecraft thing. Uh, there's going to be, that's going to be our interplanetary tug. Obviously I still need to add parachute and solar panels and batteries and all that shebang, but that's the basic framework all laid out. Now we're going to build the Juna lander. Yeah, even though I I didn't have that much time I decided that yeah let's just do an Apollo style one again so we'll build a separate lander can that will go down to the surface you know how Apollo style works right but I guess in case you don't maybe there's people who've never really played KSV1 you're now watching this video to see what the KSV2 is going to be like uh yeah Apollo style means that you have a uh, well basically a direct ascent mission which is what most people first start out doing in Kerbal Space Program because it's much easier uh, you basically launch a rocket the entire thing goes and lands on the moon then the entire thing goes back and that's it Apollo style is, like the name suggests, similar sort of flight plan to what the astronauts who flew on the Apollo missions in the 60s and 70s did, where there is a separate lander and a separate mothership. So the whole, the mothership and the lander fly to orbit of whichever planet or moon you're visiting. Then the lander detaches and lands, leaving the mothership in orbit. You do all your surface antics, get back on the lander, and then fly back up into orbit, redock with the mothership, and then fly back. Advantage of this, because obviously this is a much more complicated mission and it requires knowing how to do orbital docking, which is quite difficult for a lot of new players. The big advantage of an Apollo style mission though is that it really simplifies the design of the lander. So uh, in an Apollo style mission, the lander only needs to be capable of getting back into orbit of whatever planet or moon you're uh, visiting. Uh, a direct ascent, it has to have the Delta V to do that and then also get back home, which can be a very demanding ask. Maybe not so much for the Mun and Minmus, a lot more so for Juno, but it is definitely possible to do direct ascent. But places like Eve and Tylo, it's borderline impossible to do without doing an Apollo style mission there. Because Eve, if you don't know, is basically the in-game analog of Venus. It's more difficult to get off the surface of Eve and reach orbit than it is to get off the surface of Kerbin and reach orbit. So you can imagine how massive an Eve capable rocket would need to be. Direct Ascent Eve is very much possible, but it's just not practical. So being able to do the orbital rendezvous seen in an Apollo style mission layout really does unlock the game. So there's a sort of if you're trying to get better at the game, you're just learning and you want something to kind of practice on. That, I would say, is a big priority of a big skill to try and nail. I'm just going to speed the footage up a little bit here because I was just faffing around for ages, not really achieving anything with this lander. By the way, this Juno lander is very, very overkill. It uh, has way more Delta V than it needs. I just wanted it to be absolutely foolproof and definitely, definitely work. Uh, well, I say I was faffing around for this bit, by the way, but I'm just adding things like batteries and uh, solar panels and stuff. It isn't really that interesting to watch. I want to kind of get to the construction of the uh, the rest of the rocket, the fairing, etc., etc. And uh, we need to add some struts as well, of course. Auto strut is not in this version of Kerbal Space Program 2, unfortunately. It's going to be added, according to the devs, but it ain't here right now at launch. So we're going to have to be go back to how we had to build rockets in KSP World, which was just strut everything to high heaven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, there go the struts there. Okay, I'm going to slow down the playback. It's still a little bit faster than real time speed just to keep the video flowing nicely. But uh, yeah, I'm not playing it back quite as quickly now because uh, I, wanna, you, I want you guys to appreciate what I'm doing here. I'm building the fairing in just a second. And I really struggled. I really, really struggled to build the fairing. I couldn't get it to work the way I wanted it to. So maybe I was doing something wrong that you guys will pick up on. Because again, I was rushing when I was building this rocket because I was aware I only had a limited amount of time left to film this mission so uh yeah here we are we've got the base basic payload there we're going to build the fairing up now so this is how you build fairings you use these arrow keys and you press the plus to keep making the fairing bigger and bigger but then after a while it stops allowing you to build the fairing a certain height and that to me and the fairing size we have it does seem a little bit unreasonably stumpy like, I feel like you should be able to build taller fairings. Like, ideally, there shouldn't be a limit because this is Kerbal Space Program, mate. Okay, I want to build something ridiculous. Uh, so in the end, I had to just go for a uh, interstage fairing like this and just have the uh, the command the command pod the command module. Can I speak English properly? Uh, exposed at the top. But I guess it still looks okay. So we can just move on. Just build a really basic rocket with the, I think that's the skipper engine from Kerbal Space Program 1. And we'll put a big dumb booster at the bottom just with a couple of the big tanks and a little tank at the bottom. And then we've got the mammoth engine to cap everything off. And the mammoth engine in this game is no longer a block of four vector engines or four RS-25 equivalent engines because it looks like the SLS engine block. It's just a single engine bell now. 
Now here I was struggling to get the uh, rocket repainted. See, I'm changing the accent colors, but uh, it's still got a green accent color. I realize you have to click the rocket in order to apply that color change, because I guess you could have more than one rocket in this workspace, right? So I guess this makes sense. So if you're trying to change the color of your craft when you play this game, and you, you can't seem to get it, you have to click it. So there you go. There. You're welcome. There's This was a tutorial this whole time. How about that? Anyway, the rocket is finished, and you'll see I remembered to add parachutes at the very last moment. Uh, here we are on the launch pad. I'm going to shut up now and let you bask in the glory that is the uh, the countdown. Hey. Hey. Yeah, I, had, I don't know quite how I hadn't noticed the fact that the rocket was all out of alignment and very, very suboptimal at the top, top of the stack just there. Um, we need auto strut. Please add it as soon as possible. Uh, KSP development team who may or may not be watching this video, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, quickly, uh, I quickly reverted back to VAB and thought, right, obviously the fairing hadn't attached properly to the upper stage, so we need to just delete the fairing and you know, get it working properly. So I tried, maybe we had a bug and that's why I couldn't build the fairing any taller, but no, that green plus button to extend it up just disappeared. So uh, I decided to make it a bit stumpy. I just closed it off around the bottom of the hydrogen tank. You know, that gold structure there, just in case. Cause it, I don't know if you watch the footage back, if you go and watch the footage back, it doesn't look like I placed it like that. I tried to make the fairing taller and it wouldn't let me. And then it just sort of automatically closed the fairing. Like that's maybe it just like, glitched it so maybe the fairing just didn't build properly is what i'm trying to say in a really long way <laughs> uh, so yeah i'm trying to get it to close around without interfering with another part was a little bit tricky i'm hoping this is just because i'm not used to building fairings in this game and it will get a bit easier once i'm used to this new system i'm not sure if i do actually prefer the new system to the old system the old system was quite simple wasn't it you basically just draw the fairing out by clicking with your mouse and it just it just worked this one just feels like a little bit more cumbersome. Maybe there's a good reason for it that will become clear as we play the game more and more. But for right now, I'm not sure if I like this new fairing system. Uh, I thought as well, to help facilitate the rocket's uh, stability, um, I'd add a few more struts. Because when in doubt, just add more struts, right? More boosts if it's not moving, more struts if it is moving, but, you know, shouldn't be moving. <laughs> uh, so there we are. That's pretty much the... Uh, this version of the rocket done. In fact, actually, it's not. I decided to add a few uh, tail fins because uh, this is a very similar rocket to my Mun rocket. You know, the one I built for my Apollo style Mun mission that I did in KSP2, my first ever KSP2 video, in fact. Um, so, and that and that flipped out a lot on launch. I needed to add tail fins. So I thought, let's uh, add tail fins to this one. Here we are counting down once again. But there is just no time. I have to look. I was running out of time very quickly. I've only just launched this thing. I'd forgotten to launch at a Juna phase angle as well. So there was that as well. Um, yeah. So just in case anyone had any worries that, oh, the countdown is cute, but I'm going to get, it's going to get old real fast. You can just skip the countdown. But I don't know. I like the countdown. Uh, here you can see that the oceans have gone. Uh, global warming has really, in order to build this rocket, Kerbin had to use all of its water uh, and also the, uh, the sky lost its refractive power, so we don't have any blue skies anymore. So, bit of a weird visual bug. It's going to be here now for a while in this video, but it does eventually resolve itself. So, I'm just, just addressing the elephant in the room there. Although, you know, the the, uh, the space center's water is still there. So, that's interesting, isn't it? And guys, can we just appreciate that rocket sound for a moment? Yeah, in case you didn't know, uh, the rocket sounds in Kerbal Space Program 2 are recorded from actual real rockets. So it's a real rocket engine noise uh, when, when you hear rocket sounds in this game. I don't know if it's every engine that's like that, but you know, at least this engine sounds pretty authentic, right, doesn't it? So I'm guessing this engine certainly is. Uh, and yeah, here we are. It was really hard to tell how high I was because there were no clouds and uh, I'm not kind of used to the UI still, so I, I'm used to looking in the middle of the screen at the top to look at my altitude. I'm like, oh yeah, it's not there anymore. It's on the uh, the nav ball. And like, I just looked at the nav ball now and it takes me still a second to remember where the altitude gauge is now. It's, uh, it's the pink ground marker. So we're at 21,000 meters right now. So uh, yes, that's uh, it just took me a bit used to and I was trying to figure out how to do my gravity turn and 
knowing where to look now to see things like my surface velocity and eventually orbital velocity and my altitude and where my apoapsis is and where my periapsis are because they're on the screen now underneath the nav board. It's just knowing where things are. Uh, my eyes, they're not used to it yet, but they hopefully should get used to it fairly quickly. And then it's going to be jarring going back to Kerbal Space Program 1, right? Because I think I probably am still going to make the odd Kerbal Space Program 1 video here and there because there's a lot of sto there's a lot of stones left unturned in that game and what does the new Monarch mean? Hey, there's a that old chestnut there is a mystery that still needs to be investigated. So I don't know what I'm going to I think initially I'm just going to focus on purely KSP2 content, but then maybe I might try and start varying the content. So there's a bit of KSP1, bit of KSP2. Can I go from there? So no, I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts, really. Maybe not on this particular video, because KSP2 isn't out yet. But once KSP2 is out and we're all playing it, then we can have a bit of a community engagement sort of thing. And, uh, you know, see you kind of test the waters of like KSP1 again. Go, go from there, basically. So here we are approaching orbit. I'm just creating a maneuver node to get ourselves circularized. And, uh, yeah, then we can perform that burn and get ready to begin our journey to Duna. Which uh, there were some trials and tribulations, let me tell you, which will become, which will make manifest very soon. But first, we need to uh, get to our maneuver node. I think I might just speed the footage up a little bit now to keep the video flowing. And yeah, that looks good. Oh, that weird unpaused pause glitch, which again, I've already said now many times that that shouldn't be there for you guys, or at least if it is, it won't be there for very long because it's an about glitch and it's a new glitch, so the devs are on it. Uh, now we're circularizing in low carbon orbit. There goes our periapsis, and we are now circular. Well, we're circular now, but we're in, a, we're in, a, we're in an orbit, is what I meant to say. And we have uh, quite a lot of Delta V left in this stage, actually. So I didn't really design this craft very well. I mean, what you're seeing now, aside from obviously the initial launch where everything went wrong, this is only the second actual launch. I didn't test anything or verify that we had enough Delta V for each phase of the mission because... I only had a very short amount of time to do this. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of make it overkill so that I definitely would have enough um, Delta V. Now, hey, look at that. How quick was the transition from flying the rocket to going to the tracking station? One of my favorite quality of life changes in KSP2. Now you can just switch to the tracking station on a dime. It's brilliant. Uh, and the reason I switched to the tracking station is because I wanted to time warp faster than I was able to when focused on my ship in low carbon orbit because there's a time warp lock when you're that close to a celestial body. So I thought I'll go to the tracking station so I can time warp a little bit faster. But I still couldn't time warp. I still couldn't time warp very fast. I don't know what was happening. How do I do faster time warp? Everybody, sorry to ruin your recordings. Uh, we're going to stop in five minutes. So just want to give you a quick warning. Grab the video of your shots. Okay. Well, Crash the route last thing. <laughs> Okay, so you had a five minute warning, so let's just abandon this student mission. Well, the final five minutes has come. I know, I'm panicking now. What are you for five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Since we've got five minutes, what was the plane challenge you said? You came up with a plane challenge, right? Flying through Bridges. under both of the catwalks and then flying through between the, the, the Between the parking lots? Yeah. And then the bridge? And then the bridge. Are there yeah. any other things you can fly under? Uh, I, I flew through the satellite dish. <laughs> oh right, there's the there's the gauntlet thrown. I don't think I've got time to like uh, make a craft, so I'm just going to use my SST I made, which is probably a bad idea. It's hard to tell which craft it is. Like whenever I save, it comes up with like two dialogue things I have to. Yes. It, okay, it's not just me then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's doing the same thing to me. I think things like that, if it is just not me being an idiot, the community's gonna feed that back wow. real quick. That, that's a great sun. I chose the wrong time to watch. Wrong time to watch. Right, we're gonna do the Jatwa bridge challenge. Whoa, look at that sunset. I, I know, that's that's a vicious sunrise I have going on here. I'm in the dark. Oh no, it's just glitched. It is daytime though. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely just completely glitched. It wasn't nighttime, it was daytime, but for whatever reason, the the light... I mean, I guess the lighting is there, we just haven't got the blue sky. I'm guessing whatever is the blue sky filter is in the game isn't loading. But hey, here we are launching on our epic mission. You know what, we're just gonna... We're just gonna fly it 
with this like sketchy lighting. Oh, no. <laughs> <sighs> I guess we're going this way. <laughs> For the Jatwa Bridge Challenge that I'm doing right now, I'm going to leave you mostly in the hands of live Matt rather than, you know, editing, commentating after the fact Matt. That's that's me right now. Hello. Uh, because we couldn't play multiplayer at this event because multiplayer isn't a thing right now, but this is about as close as you can get to multiplayer, right? Me and Billy next to me both try to do the Bridge Challenge together like a LAN party, so consider this uh, the first ever KSP2 multiplayer experience. I hope you enjoy. I lost one of my tails. <laughs> That's certainly not going to make things easier. Easy does it. <laughs> so, you don't need to see. I just didn't have one in there. I think I can do it without it. Okay, there's the bridge. Through the trees. Where are these cat Well, there they are. I'm going to try and get this lined up. Whoa. I think I've got like a minute until end time. So this is it. Oh my god, the, the ocean's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, global warming is certainly Nate, I found a glitch. <laughs> Right, lining up perfectly. This is it. This is the moment. Watch me nail this in one go, Billy. First time, here we go. Then from there underneath the, the bridge. Very, very glitched graphic. Oh, it's not going well. <laughs> oh! Oh, that? Yeah, I did that the first time. Yeah, there's this one here. So something, it's just under both of those? Yeah. That, under the, um, under this, both. the car parks. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I'm blaming oh, my... Uh, that one as well. I think I had, uh, that this one. Oh, I've managed to fix my lighting. There we go. Yeah, this one do do oh. I think I got it. I think I got it. Oh, oh no, I do not have it. <laughs> no, no, but some of your debris then. <laughs> <laughs> it was so close. I got caught. Here we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, here you go. You've got to go through the car park. All right. Oh. I'm going to try this. I don't think you can time. go through the car park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the car park. <laughs> I tried to go through like the levels. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, here we go. Here's the last shot. Yes, the dress has a ring. Is that? I did not see that. Oh! Oh no, I'm not paying attention. Oh, I'm giving up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, the stress has got to me. The stress. I love the, the feeling. Stress. This is, it's a thrill. I have Valentina this time. I think Bob is just cursing me. That's the thing. It's um, <laughs> blame, blame Bob. <laughs> All right. You got it hard. It's good. <laughs> As the bell right. chimes! <laughs> <laughs> right, save. This I'm like, oh, I wasn't recording. Oh, <laughs> that was... <laughs> That's intense, no? <laughs> that, that rattles the nerves a bit every time I try. <laughs> it. 
But that concludes this little uh, three short story, this little trilogy of incomplete missions video. Hope you enjoyed it. I think this was actually one of the more fun KSP2 videos out of the three that I've made. Hey, I did a trilogy of KSP2 videos and the third in the trilogy was itself another trilogy. How epic gamer is that? Uh, which was your favourite? Was it the Apollo style mum? Was it the SSTO? Was it this one? Uh, I think I liked the bridge challenge at the end. A little bit of wholesome multiplayer action. Um, I've also got like, um, I know this is like the final KSP2 preview video I'll be making because I've now run out of footage capture, but I'll probably make some shorts and I do have a KSP2 developer interview. I don't know if I've published that already. I, I haven't really figured out my upload schedule for this week yet. Uh, I'll probably have to piece all this together. Uh, at some point before I upload the first KSP2 video. So you guys, this is now, I'm just talking to myself. You guys don't need to know this. But you do need to know that the people on screen right now on the left, my patrons and channel members, are awesome. And if you want to join their magnificent ranks, you can do so by clicking the link in the description or clicking that orange card on screen to go to Patreon. You get early access to some of my videos, which is all great. And obviously you help support what I do here. But guys, I do hope you enjoyed my Kerbal Space Program 2 preview event video footage that I showed you guys. I look forward to making many more KSP2 videos for you. I'll do some streams when the game comes out as well. I hope you guys all look forward to the game as well. And I've run out of time now, so goodbye.